In the beginning, the Creator formed the Wheel of Time to act as a cosmic loom, using living beings as threads, weaving a great pattern which encompassed all worlds and realities. Turning through the power of the true source, the wheel had seven spokes, representing seven ages, repeating in an unending cycle. At the same time all this came into existence, the Creator imprisoned the Dark One outside reality, a primordial being of pure evil, seeking to destroy the Wheel of Time in order to recreate the universe in his own image. Though none can be certain about the origins and purpose of the Dark One, some believed he served as a necessary counterbalance to the benevolent nature of the Creator, allowing selfishness, greed, violence, and other negative traits to exist, thereby giving all sentient beings the gift of free will. Representing opposite values, the Dark One sought desperately to break through the pattern and interact with those within, while the Creator made many worlds and left humankind to make of it what they would. Refraining from direct interference, he watched his worlds flower and die, then went on to make endless others. A gardener did not weep for each blossom that fell. Though everything in the Great Pattern was largely predetermined, with events and peoples repeated and reincarnated throughout the ages, some variation did occur, especially as it pertained to the Dark One who was constantly trying to interfere and influence reality. In order to correct these larger disruptions, the wheel produced Taviran, people of extraordinary importance, ability, and influence, born into the world with a specific purpose, allowing them to alter reality as needed until the pattern was restored. As a result, Taviran did not possess the same level of free will as other beings, and were known to bring times of great struggle and hardship to those around them. While little is known about the seven ages of the wheel, surviving remnants suggest the first age was a period where humanity named their world Earth, as evidenced by certain legends like that of Len who flew to the moon in the belly of an eagle made of fire and his daughter Salia who walked among the stars. These figures may represent the astronauts John Glenn and Sally Ride, as well as the Apollo rockets which landed on the moon. Then there were the stories of Mosk the Giant who wielded a lance of fire which could reach around the world, and his enemy Merck, referring to the Soviet Union's Cold War with America and their stockpiles of nuclear weapons. There was also Elsbit, the Queen of All, denoting Queen Elizabeth I, Anla the Wise Counselor who may have been the advice columnist Stan Landers, Jaim the Giant Slayer, representing the storybook character from Jack and the Beanstalk, as well as Matteris the Healer, mother of the Wondrous Inn, which could have been Mother Teresa. Bones from an animal that may have been a giraffe also survived into the Third Age, in addition to a three-pointed star within a circle said to represent pride and vanity, which may have been the symbol of a Mercedes-Benz. It was also believed that at some point, portal stones may have been created in this period, gateways which led to other worlds and realities. Though it was uncertain what role magic played in the first age, by the second age it was a fundamental part of their civilization, leading to a golden era of peace and prosperity. Known as the One Power, derived from the true source, this magical energy was divided into two halves, with males channeling Psydeen while females used Psydar. Affecting only 2-3% of the population, those capable of wielding the One Power were called Aes Sedai, meaning servants of all, trained to channel this energy into elemental magic spells using earth, spirit, water, air, and fire. Wielding these powers for the benefit of all, social and professional status was dependent on good works and service to humanity, resulting in the elimination of hunger, poverty, and homelessness, while creating advanced technologies, perfecting food production, and joining together under a united world government, advised by the Hall of Servants, where Aes Sedai leaders gathered to make decisions. Though humans made up the majority of the population, they lived and worked alongside other races like the Ogier, large, thoughtful, peace-loving humanoids with a deep connection to the natural world, and Nim, sentient tree-like beings which helped increase crop yields. While Aes Sedai were varied in their raw potential and trained abilities, their powers were amplified and expanded through Angrial, Songrial, and Terangrial, magical artifacts which allowed channelers to wield more Psydeen or Sidar without risk of death or burning themselves out. 
Though many believe humanity lived in a perfect utopia during the Age of Legends, there may have actually been a number of social problems growing beneath the surface, which were accelerated and exploited when a number of their top scientists, including Bidoman and Mirren Aranayil at the prestigious University of Kolum Dawn, discovered the true power, a new source of magical energy located beyond the pattern of reality. Learning that the true power could be accessed equally by both men and women, and was thus free from the frustrating limitations of the one power, researchers created the bore by drilling a small hole through the pattern, only to learn this new form of energy came from the Dark One Shaitan. Although the boar was not big enough for this great evil to escape his prison, it allowed him to directly influence their reality, creating a renaissance of greed, anger, jealousy, and violence which swept across the world. Over the next century, humanity grew increasingly susceptible to their evil impulses, leading many to the Dark One, lured by promises of immortality and greater prominence in the New World Order. While ordinary humans who turned to the shadow were known as friends of the dark, his greatest servants were the Aes Sedai defectors called the Chosen or Forsaken who led his forces and governed conquered territories. Among the 29 Forsaken who were allowed to use the true power, 13 stood above the others in might and authority remembered for thousands of years to come as Ishamael, Ravin, Demondrid, Samael, Agenor, Balthamel, Osmodian, Balal, Lanfear, Semiraj, Mogidian, Grendal, and Masana. Launching the War of the Shadow, also called the War of Power, a devastating 10-year conflict in which the Forsaken sought to release the Dark One from captivity, their armies were greatly augmented by Trollocs and other shadow spawn, vicious monsters they created and bred for battle. The forces of Shadow, however, were somewhat hampered by constant infighting as the Forsaken competed to be named Nablus or second-in-command to Shaitan who encouraged their rivalries as he wanted only the strongest serving his will. Organizing themselves under their greatest channeler, the dragon Luz Theron Telamon, the forces of light fought back but suffered from their own internal struggles beset with betrayals, disorganization, low morale, and increased division among their leadership. Threatened by impending defeat, two competing proposals for victory were considered by the Aes Sedai in the Hall of Servants. The first, advocated by Luz Theron Telamon, sought to use both Sidene and Sidar to seal the boar with seven Quendiar, while the second option, supported by the female Aes Sedai Latra Pose Concord, wanted to use special Terangrial and Songrial to create a secondary prison around the boar. A staunch enemy of Luz Theron's plan, Latra conspired against him by forming the fateful Concord, where all the most powerful female Aes Sedai of the Hall made an agreement forbidding them from aiding his efforts. Though this allowed her plan to move forward, it was soon made impossible when the territory holding the necessary Terangrial was captured by the enemy. With all efforts to retrieve the Terangrial failing and shadow forces on the brink of victory, Luz Theron again tried to advocate for his position, but the female Aes Sedai continued to oppose him, and so he chose to enact his plan without the aid of any woman. Accompanied by 113 of his closest supporters, called the Hundred Companions, and an honor guard of 10,000 warriors, Luz Theron and his male Aes Sedai made their way to Sheol Ghul, the focal point of the Dark One's power, and proved doubly successful in their efforts, both sealing away Shaitan and his 13 most powerful Forsaken. However, because there were no females present, the males exclusively used Sidene in their ritual, allowing the Dark One to perform a counterstroke, tainting the male half of the One Power with his corruption, ensuring that anyone who used Sidene from that point forward inevitably went mad with an unyielding desire for chaos, destruction, and violence. Although the Dark One was defeated, every wielder of Sidene left alive lost their sanity, resulting in the breaking of the world a three centuries long period of mass devastation which reshaped lands and seas, only ending when female Aes Sedai finished killing or gentling their male counterparts. As for Luz Theron, he went on to murder his own family in his madness, and upon realizing what he did, killed himself in a massive explosion of Sidene which created Dragonmount and the island later called Tarvalin. Though the Dark One and Forsaken were gone, the problems faced in sealing the boar meant the threat was not completely eradicated, and so prophecies emerged, including the Corathon Cycle, which foresaw the return of the Shadow, as well as the Dragon reborn in a new body to once again face off against this evil and save the world.
Thus began the Third Age and years after breaking, when humanity attempted to recover in the face of violence and division as new realms and peoples rose to prominence. In the western continent of Shan Chan, surviving female Aes Sedai rose to power, conquering their own territories while competing for resources and authority. Developing into ruthless despots who believed honor, truth, and loyalty utter foolishness, these Aes Sedai killed any male channelers they found and led their people to a near constant state of war over the next 2,000 years, making stability or any sort of unification effort nearly impossible. Moving on to the land of the Mad Men, the southern continent was a chaotic, troubled region of primitive hovel dwellers, where both male and female channelers of the One Power ran rampant without restraint. Though the insanity of the males caused significant seismic activity, the females were also considered dangerous and unpredictable as they were never able to unify or organize themselves to the extent necessary to control their male counterparts. Though some ships eventually visited this continent, the native population immediately attacked anyone who went ashore, and so travel was forbidden to these lands. Lastly, there was the eastern continent, divided into four unique regions, surrounded by the Arith Ocean, Sea of Storms, and Moranel Ocean. Beginning in the north, there were the Mountains of Doom, which stretched across the continent, separating the southern realms from the redlands of the Great Blight, where surviving Shadow Spawn, loyal to the Dark One, lived and organized their attacks against the realms of men. A bleak and largely barren region, the most notable landmark was the Black Mountain of Sheol Ghul, where Luz Theron sealed the boar to imprison the Dark One and thirteen Forsaken. To the southeast of the Great Blight were the lands of Shara, where a harsh, rigid, slave-trading people founded a secretive, unified nation ruled by a single, absolute monarch. The nation of Shara refused almost all contact with the outside world, allowing only a few merchants and gleemen to visit designated trade cities. Although they had magic users called Ayad, only females had any rights, while males were used as breeding stock until inevitably killed by around the age of 21. The antithesis of the Corathon cycle, Sharans had a prophecy foretelling the emergence of a great hero named Bao the Wild, who would one day lead their people to fight against the Dragon Reborn. Further west, beyond the vast cliffs of the Dawn Mountain Range and Great Rift Canyon, were the barren desert lands of the Aiel Waste, also called the Threefold Land by the local Aiel population, a harsh, strong, resilient, spear-wielding people who wore veils when they fought. Due to the extreme heat and scarcity of rivers, the honor-obsessed Aiel clans valued water above almost anything, with water oaths considered unbreakable vows. Though female channelers were made wise ones, acting as advisors to clan chiefs, males able to use the One Power were sent north to the Great Blight so they might die fighting the Dark One. These wastelands had only one abandoned city called Ruidion, where none but their clan chiefs and wise ones could venture. Similar to the Dragon Reborn prophecy, the Aiel believed there would one day rise a chief of chiefs to both destroy and save their people. Finally, there were the Westlands, beyond the spine of the World Mountains, where ten nations rose in the years after breaking, led by monarchs and aristocrats ruling over common folk who worked the land and served in their armies. Of all the Aes Sedai remnants scattered across the world, the female channelers of the Westlands retained the most authority and unity. However, they too were plagued with division and strife in these early years, as competing factions warred for power throughout the first century after breaking. In the end, one Aes Sedai faction emerged victorious, founding the powerful city of Tarvalin to serve as their base of operations. Though male channelers in the Westlands were killed or gentled by the Aes Sedai of Tarvalin, some caused great devastation before they were captured, especially those who attempted to fulfill the Corathon Cycle prophecy by declaring themselves the Dragon Reborn. In 335 AB, Rowlin Darkspain emerged as the first false dragon of the Third Age, raising armies for war until eventually captured and gentled by Tarvalin. While ten nations ruled over the Westlands for a thousand years, this came to an end with the Trollic Wars from 1000 to 1350 AB, when a figure called Baalzamon and his dreadlords led shadow spawn armies from the Great Blight to attack the lands of the south. Among the many nations to fall in these wars, one of the most disturbing instances was Aridal, where Mordeth, an advisor to the king, grew so obsessed with defeating the Shadow, he unleashed an even worse evil known as Mashadar, which utterly destroyed their capital city, leaving it a cursed ruin renamed Shadar Logoth. 
Yet while the fall of Aridal was terrifying, the fall of their neighboring realm, Manetherin, was far more tragic, as their courageous King Aemon and his armies fought desperately to defend their nation until ultimately defeated. Sensing the death of her husband, the king's Aes Sedai wife went mad with grief, killing herself in an explosion of magical energy which destroyed both the Shadowspawn army and Manetherin's capital city. Throughout the years of this war, Urien's Stonebow emerged as another false dragon, lasting from 1300 to 1308 AB until he too was defeated. After over three centuries of fighting the Trollic Wars, the ten nations of the Westlands were no more, replaced with 29 successor realms, which ruled throughout the Free Years. In 351 FY, Davian rose as yet another short-lived false dragon, followed by the more substantial emergence of Gwer Amalasan, who began the War of the Second Dragon from 939 to 943 FY. Despite conquering a third of the Westlands, Square was eventually defeated by King Arthur Hawkwing, who then went on to launch his own War of Conquest, uniting the entire western region of the continent, save for Tarvalin, which was besieged but never captured. A great hero, general, warrior, and high king, Arthur Hawkwing's reign started to encounter difficulties when his advisor, Jalwin Morad, gained more influence in the royal court. In addition to advising the king to send a massive fleet to conquer Shanchen in the west, Jalwin encouraged war with Tarvalin, yet his most damaging contribution came when he advised Arthur Hawkwing to refuse treatment while ill, leading to the king's early death. Dying without an heir, the Westlands erupted into the War of the Hundred Years from 994 to 1117 FY until at last the fighting ended with 24 nations and three independent city-states emerging in place of Hawkwing's empire. Over the next thousand years, called the New Era, the realms of Almoth, Goaban, Karalain, Ironvel, Kintara, Morado, Marhaden, Mosara, Hardon, and Malkir were lost, while Aridoman, Andor, Kyrian, Tarabon, Gildon, Amadisia, Altara, Mirandi, Ilion, and Tyr survived, along with the borderland nations of Saldaea, Condor, Arafel, and Shinar. There were also the city-states of Farmadding, Mayen, and Tarvalin. From 976 to 978 NE, the Westlands faced a new potentially devastating threat when battle-hardened Aeol clans crossed the spine of the world to wage war against their former friends in the nation of Kyrian. Yet while the realms of the West frantically gathered armies to stop their enemy from conquering all of the Westlands, this was never the intention of the Desert Warriors, as they merely sought to kill the King of Kyrian, who in his ignorance cut down a sacred tree gifted to their people by the Aeol. True to their word, after killing the king, they did not seek further conquest, and so returned to the Aeol Waste with their honor satisfied. From 993 to 997 NE, three more false dragons emerged, but none of them could channel, and despite causing some problems, were eventually defeated. By the year 997 NE, some of the most noteworthy regions of the Westlands included the nation of Andor, founded by Ashara Kassalane after the death of Arthur Hawkwing, who established an unbroken line of female rulers, which lasted over a thousand years. Sitting upon the Lion Throne in the capital of Camelin, the rulers of Andor were closely allied to the city-state of Tarvalin, establishing a tradition where the female heir studied with the Aes Sedai before succeeding as ruler. A powerful realm in the center of the Westlands, Andor was the oldest, largest, and most populous nation of the New Era, with the greatest, best-trained army outside the Borderlands. Aside from the famous, beautiful city of Camelin, Andor was home to a great white bridge from the Age of Legends and the mining town of Berlong near the ruins of Shadar Logoth. Though much of the realm remained loyal to the Queen, the far western region of the Two Rivers, bordering the Mountains of Mist, grew estranged from the capital, with its people unaware they were part of a larger nation. Having forgotten much of their history, the Two Rivers region was once a part of the Kingdom of Manetherin, with the village of Emmons Field, built upon the site of their last battle, where King Aemon fought to the death, defending their realm from Trollic invasion. There was also the nation of Amadisia, home to the Children of the Light, an independent military organization dedicated to fighting the Dark One and everything they associated with him, including the Aes Sedai of Tarvalin. With a weak ruler reigning from the capital of Amador, the Children of the Light were the true power in Amadisia, making it the only nation where Aes Sedai and channeling the One Power were entirely outlawed. Ruled by a king wearing a laurel crown, Ilion was home to the Great Hunt of the Horn, a famous event where mighty adventurers attempted to find the Horn of Valir, an ancient relic from a previous age, with the power to summon the greatest heroes of history from the dead so they might fight for the forces of light in the final battle of Tarmin Gaiden. 
A neighbor and enemy of Ilion, the nation of Tyr was ruled by a council of high lords and held an important ancient heritage, as they were part of the Dragon Reborn prophecy, which said, The Stone of Tyr will never fall till Kalindor is wielded by the dragon's hand. The Stone of Tyr will never fall till the people of the dragon come. Those who lived in Tyr, therefore, believed it was their duty to protect the royal fortress called the Stone of Tyr and Crystal Sword Kalindor in order to prevent the dragon from returning to power. Then there were the Borderlands, where the five allied nations of Saldea, Kandor, Arafel, Shinar, and Malkir fought to protect the south from the shadow spawn of the Great Blight. Spending centuries in combat, the warriors of the Borderlands comprised the greatest, most well-trained armies in the Westland. However, after a thousand years on the front lines of battle, the nation of Malkir was lost in 955 NE as a result of internal strife and betrayal. Having no proper homeland, the pacifist Tuatha An, or Tinkers, were a nomadic group of traders who always claimed they were searching for the song, though for most of their history, no one truly understood what that meant. Unloved by most peoples, the Tinkers nonetheless wore bright colors and were always joyful, singing and dancing at every opportunity. Beyond the mainland, throughout the western and southern oceans, the Sea Folk, or Atha'an Mi'er, ruled over a number of islands, including Isle Dashar, Isle Somera, Isle Jafar, Tremalking, Kaim, and Sindaking, though they spent most of their lives living aboard ships. A matriarchal society, their leaders were advised by female windfinders, who wielded the one power, using their abilities to manipulate and predict the weather. Male channelers, however, were given the choice of drowning themselves or being left on a barren island without food or water. Similar to the Dragon Reborn prophecies of the mainland, the Sea Folk had the Jendai prophecies, which foretold that the Koromor would one day lead their people to greater glory and domination over all the seas of the world. In addition to these human realms and peoples, the Ogier race, also called the Westlands their home, living in steadings, ancient secluded regions of peace, where Aes Sedai could not channel the One Power. The slow, intelligent, thoughtful, and long-lived Ogier traveled through magic hidden way gates, gifted to them in the early years of the Third Age by male Aes Sedai, which allowed them to move quickly and quietly throughout the continent. Rarely seen by other humans, most Ogier prefer to live the entirety of their lives in the steadings, with no real desire to travel or visit other lands. In fact, their connection to these homelands was so strong that should they spend too much time away, they were inflicted by a deep longing which weakened them and eventually led to death. Love The Wheel of Time or any other series? Then why not check out Audible, where they have the largest collection of audiobooks available. Sign up through the links below for regular membership and get a 30-day free trial, or else try Premium Plus for a 60-day trial and up to three free audiobooks. For those who prefer to read their stories, there is the Kindle Unlimited plan, where you get as many ebooks as you wish. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson, narrated by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding, along with the prequel novel and history book. A special thanks to all those who contribute to Civilization X, like Warden of the X, Sir Jeremiah Ironside of House Come Sia, Warden of the X, Chris Walder, the Crimson Shadow, Warden of the X, Sir Darren of House Ashford, and Knight of Iron and Ice, Fred Heartless. If you'd like to help the channel, be sure to give a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and click on the links below, or else go to patreon.com slash civilizationx, where you can gain early access to videos, vote on future content, and watch the Patreon-only series, Heroes of Lore and Legend.